I've been lying in my bed for hours now. It's 5.35 a.m. and there's not much I can do. You know what the worst part about my situation is? I'm in the same room with my parents. They keep looking at me, and I can't help but look back and try not to cry or scream. Their eyes are focused on me, and their mouths are wide open. There's the strong scent of blood, and I feel so paralyzed with fear. Here's the thing. The second I make any hint that I'm not asleep anymore, I'm completely fucked. I will die, and there's nobody around to save me. I've been trying to think of a way out, but the only idea I have is to rush to the door and run outside the front door and scream for help, hoping any neighbors hear me. It's risky, but if I stay here, I'll surely die. He's waiting for me to wake up and see his masterpiece. You're probably wondering what's going on. I do get ahead of myself sometimes. About three hours ago, I heard screaming from the other side of the house. I got up and went to check on the noise before realizing I had to use the bathroom. Instead of doing the smart thing and investigating, I used the bathroom first. I could have gotten myself killed right then for my stupid actions. But I actually did my business and took a peek outside the bathroom. There was blood on the carpet. I got very worried and ran back to my room, hiding under the sheets like the coward I was. I tried to convince myself to go back to sleep that it was just some really vivid dream or something. I heard my bedroom door open, and like the terrified child that I was, I peeked from under the blankets to see what was going on. I could see something dragging my dead parents into the room. It was not human. I could tell you that. It was hairless, with no eyes and no clothing. It walked like a caveman with its back slouched as it dragged my parents. But this thing was much smarter than any caveman. It was aware of what it was doing. It propped my dad up on the edge of my bed and made him face me. It then sat my mother down in the chair and positioned her towards me as well. It then started rubbing its hands upon the wall, staining them with blood, and then drew a circle with the devil's pentagram in it. This thing had made what it would probably call a masterpiece, and to finish it off, it scribbled a message onto the wall that I could not read in the darkness. It then positioned itself under my bed waiting to strike. The scariest thing is now my eyes have adjusted to the darkness since then and I can read the message on the wall. I don't want to look at it because it's terrifying to think about, but I feel I need to see before I'm killed. I peek at the creature's masterpiece. I know you're awake. After moving to a small town in southern Michigan, I got a job as a cashier in the local store. After work, I would walk home to my small house and order a small pizza. This was my routine for two weeks when things took a strange turn. I called in my usual order to the pizzeria when a new voice, one I hadn't heard before, answered the phone and told me, the usual, no problem. I'll deliver it in less than five minutes. Sure enough, Within five minutes, my order was delivered, and it was exactly what I had ordered every night before. When I tried to give the delivery boy a tip, he declined. He said he didn't need it, and that he was just working at the pizzeria to get out of the house and try to meet new people. This became my new routine for about three months. I'd order the same pizza, and the same delivery boy would stop by my house at the same time. It was sort of a running joke between us how he knew my routine so well that I always had exactly what he needed. When I grew tired of eating the same thing every night, on my way home, I stopped at the small diner across the street from the pizza place and had a nice dinner. Through the window, I saw my usual delivery boy leave the pizzeria with a box in hand, heading toward my block. I returned home later than usual, and I found a pizza box sitting on my doorstep. On the box was a note that said, Missed you. Guess I'll get what you owe me tomorrow. This creeped me out. I called the pizzeria and told the manager what I had found. I told him about the message and that the past three months the same delivery boy had been stopping by and that I was sure he was the one who left the note. It was then the manager told me something I never expected. Ma'am, we don't deliver.
My cat keeps scratching outside my door. It was late on Sunday evening, and I had to work the next day. I tossed and turned violently on my twin-sized bed. From behind the door, my cat Charlie was scratching like mad to get in. He had been going at it for a good five minutes now, and wasn't showing any signs of stopping. Sure, the simple solution would have been to simply let him in and run rampant around my bedroom. I couldn't have that. Besides, he would get all of his messy fur over my expensive bed covers. I did debate a few times getting up and just letting him in, but quickly got back into bed before my feet even touched the ground. From behind the door, Charlie continued scratching. After some time had passed, soft murmuring could be heard coming from outside my door. It was clearly Charlie trying his best to convince me to let him inside. I still wasn't having any of it. The constant scratching on the door from Charlie's paws was beginning to aggravate me as I'm sure it would anyone else in my situation. Charlie was also beginning to become impatient as he began digging his claws into the carpet outside my room. I wouldn't be surprised if he had done some serious damage to the door. It was already filled to the brim with cuts and marks as it was. I looked over at my alarm clock and saw that it just had gone 2 in the morning. This was getting ridiculous, as I had to go to work in just a few hours. Charlie, cut it out! I yelled as loud as I could, but the tiredness was evident in my voice. Everything fell silent for a few minutes until I heard Charlie scratching at the door again. He also went back to making that soft murmuring sound. It wasn't even meowing, it was just a soft murmur, kind of like he was purring. He was really going at the door now. He was scratching so much that it was driving me insane. I decided to turn over to my other side, while simultaneously ignoring Charlie's constant scratching of my door. Whilst turning over to my other side, I felt a large lump at the bottom of my bed. I found that odd and leaned over to touch the lump. I felt something soft and furry. A soft purring noise could be heard as I stroked it. That's when something dawned on me. My cat was already in bed with me. Okay, disclaimer. To the very best of my knowledge, this story is true. I don't expect to convince you. Truth be told, I've had a hard time coming to terms with it myself. Cliche as it may be, I am a really rational person, and if not for this, I would probably be the most stone-faced atheist you'd ever meet. But after much internal struggle and debate, I've come to the conclusion that there are things in life that simply can't be explained with reason, at least in the form in which we know it. Logic, for all the trust we place in it, is really nothing more than a candle all too easily snuffed out. And when it's gone, we're left alone in the dark and everything we would scoff at by daylight suddenly becomes very believable. All right, before I wax too melodramatic, here's my story. I was very young, only four or five at most, before either of my siblings were born. It was just mommy and daddy and me, living in our little house in Great Bend, Kansas. Very quaint. We were a young family without much money, and most of our furniture was secondhand. It was the middle of the day, summer, Hot. Boring. I was playing marbles by myself on the thin carpet beside the huge old flower patterned couch. My mom was down the hall in the kitchen, and dad was at work. Why I was trying to roll marbles around on the carpet, I don't know. We had a perfectly good linoleum floor after all. But there I was, swishing the marbles back and forth, happily bouncing them into each other. Then, in my overzealous enthusiasm, I rolled too hard. My favorite marble, the clear ruby red one zipped into the dark space under the couch and was lost. Damn it. Dad wasn't home and he was the only one strong enough to move the huge old couch for me. I'd have to get my marble back myself. I reached my hand under the couch, tentatively at first, then deeper. Encountering no marbles, I pulled my hand out in disappointment. Then a hand reached out from under the couch back at me. I remember the image vividly, and I suspect I always will. It was a slim hand with tapered fingers, a woman's hand. 
It was gnarled and wrinkled, as if aged, and it was dead black. Not black as an African, black as in dead. Of course, back then, I didn't know that corpses black and as they decompose, so I didn't know what that black meant. The hand reached out to me as far as it could, which was just up to the wrist. Then it retreated under the couch. Then it emerged again, this time pushing with it a little crumpled up bag with a logo on it I didn't recognize. It waited as if expecting me to take the bag. Then, when I didn't, it pulled the bag back under the couch and was gone. I got up, walked down to the kitchen, and told my mom what had happened. Why didn't I run screaming, or at least run? I don't really know. All I can say is, I was a little kid. A hand reaching out from under the couch at me didn't seem like a huge deal. I hadn't yet learned what was and was not permissible in reality. I had no worldview. Mom was skeptical, but walked me back to the couch and explained how I was probably imagining things. She even reached her hand under the couch to convince me that nothing was down there. Later, Dad lifted the couch up for me, and the only thing under it was, of course, my missing marble. Plus a few more marbles I didn't even remember losing. But here's the scary part. For years, I remembered this. I even developed a weird fantasy of little hand people living under the couch, and I, in my childlike innocence, believed that they would catch me and take me away if I ever reached into their domain again. Then as I grew older, I wrote the memory off as a dream I had had as a child. Cute, but silly. Then a few years ago, I recounted the story to my mother. She gave me a funny look and told me she remembered it because, after all, she had been there. She told me that she remembered me coming to her in the middle of the day and telling her about the hand under the couch and remembered being highly disturbed by my story since I was an extremely quiet, well-behaved kid who would never lie. Then she had told me about the couch. According to her, she and dad had gotten the couch from an estate of an old woman who actually died on it. This was the first time I had heard about this, but it sure explained why they got rid of the couch within a month of my story. But here's the part that truly frightens me even to this day. The part that I have to try so hard to get out of my mind some nights. Remember that bag the hand pushed towards me? I've never forgotten the logo that was on it. And recently, as in a few years ago, I saw that same logo again on what looked like the same type of bag in a hardware store. It was a bag of utility razor blades. <laughs>